Hello, and welcome back to Later Global Cultures. I'm Professor Amy Young, and today we're taking a look at the early modern era. This, chronologically, is the time leading up to World War I, and this is an era where, again, sentiments are divided. As we move through the contexts and expressions, see if you can tell where there is both optimism and anxiety. And by all means, enjoy the innovations in how humanity represents this all along the way. But before we begin, can you tell me what modern is? Is modern equivalent to cutting edge? Does it need to address some social concern? In your understanding, does modern mean that it has to be from today's culture? Well, first of all, modern for our purposes is a time frame at the turn of the 19th century that encompasses the era just before World War I and leading up to World War II. There's a very distinct flavor to expression in this time frame, and this is why scholars have set this apart as a starting point for many of the techniques and sentiments that still exist today. And just like now, modern life isn't a slow thing. For folks in this era, life had changed dramatically and rapidly. We've discussed some of this with all the revolutions around the Western world, the political, scientific, and industrial ones. And it'll continue to go fast with new ideas being introduced within just a decade or so of one another. And sometimes they're even making waves on top of each other's waves. So today we're going to run through the 40 or so years that led up to World War I. And as we do that, we'll try to understand the motivations and aims of early modern thinkers and artists and examine how creators address delight and uncertainty in this era. And today we'll start in Paris. It was just the seat of upheaval, and now it's the focus of change again. After wars with Prussia, where the city was burned, bombarded, and there was all sorts of ugliness, Napoleon III finally gets control again, and he sets out to improve things. Paris is rebuilt and beautified. Gardens and modern structures are added as city leaders want to pull it out of the Middle Ages. Plus, they improved the standard of living for everyone. More avenues made more places to sell and buy material goods and industrialism made more stuff widely available. Generally, there was an air of opportunity and optimism, the idea that things were changing for the better, and this came to be known as the Belle Epoque, or the Beautiful Age. Many French artists depict this life, and at the time, the Paris Salon controlled the art scene. They hosted juried exhibitions featuring academy standards, which were typically classically styled historical, religious, or mythological paintings, and those were precisely drawn and highly polished. In general, they preferred works that were easy to read, representationally realistic, and that showed little evidence of the artist's hand. Enter Edouard Manet. He didn't quite fit this mold, and he makes a bold statement about good art and how it shouldn't have to fit a mold. Manet still depicts the Belle Epoque, but he manages to do so without ignoring its less-than-beautiful underpinnings. And what's more, he's not interested in an entirely romantic or intellectualized interpretation of the age. So Manet is the son of a wealthy judge from an aristocratic family, and he submitted his depictions of modern life to the Salon where they were rejected. In fact, so many works were rejected by the Salon that Napoleon III created the Salon des Refusés, or the Salon of the Rejected, and this is where Manet really broke onto the scene. Even though he was rejected, his work shows us some controversial impressions of his world. Take a look at Le Déjeuner sur le Herbe, or Luncheon on the Grass. This painting is based on a drawing by Raphael, so it shows that Manet has studied the masters, but here he's breaking with tradition in a number of ways. For one, he's destroyed the impression of real space. The woman in the back is not positioned at a realistic distance, and this flattening or collapsing of space acknowledges the reality of a painting as a two-dimensional illusion. Furthermore, he's not working in the style that the salon prefers, as his brushwork is evident, not polished and smooth, and the background is sketchy rather than defined like the masters of realism. But perhaps the most controversial part of the painting is the woman in the center. Why do you think she's controversial? Sure, she's nude, but nudes are not new. The trouble is that she's not mythological or allegorical. She's not giving us the impression that she's meant to represent the eternal feminine either. 
Instead, she's ordinary, and that's made even more plain by the fact that the men in the painting aren't looking at her. Rather, they're consumed with their everyday affairs, and this woman, her name is Victorine, and Manet often used her as a model, she's looking right at you, confronting you and your notions of women as objects, and also calling out the lascivious urges of lofty Parisian society. So here, Manet is a bit of a realist as he's painting the ordinary as well as addressing the delight of this period, but he's also ushering in a new era, one that acknowledges this delight might be hypocritical, one that questions those who think themselves morally superior, and one that suggests the prosperity of the Belle Epoque might also be an illusion. In another of Manet's paintings, A Bar at the Follet's Bergeret, he again gives us a somewhat slanted impression of the Belle Epoque. He's depicted a grand beer hall in Paris, one that most would be familiar with, as all classes mingled here. The scene is one of spectacle, noise, and over-the-top entertainment. Can you see the acrobat's feet there at the top left? Plus, there are all sorts of little niceties everywhere, showing off all the consumer wealth that's available to Parisian society. If we look in the mirror behind the barmaid, we can see the top-hatted man about town. And because he's a mirror image, he's meant to be you, the viewer, in the Belle Epoque. And what about the images in the mirror? These are reflecting the seed we're in. The things that are closest to us have more solid form, so Manet is using a play on light, but he's not going for unification. There are eye-catching details, but because they're in motion, they're blurred. So again, he's abandoning the polished style of the salon, and he's perhaps depicting a more real Paris. He may even be critiquing it, too. Do you think he's being critical of consumption, or is he celebrating it? Is there anything mournful about this scene? How is Manet again calling attention to women in this society? Now, Manet wasn't the only one rejected by the Salon. The Impressionists also attempted to innovate painting in the 19th century as they depicted modern reality and put a new spin on realism. In 1874, a group of painters put together their own exhibition to show off their break with traditional painting methods, and they also put together their own show because no one else would have them. Critics who saw the show hated them, and determined that the artist's fleeting impressions could not be judged as good paintings because good paintings were representations of reality. The critics were especially bothered by Claude Monet's painting Impression Sunrise, and it's from this work that those who painted in this style got their name. Now, Impressionism is both an outgrowth of realism and a rejection of realism. You see, while these creators abandoned realistic forms like those we studied earlier in this century, they replaced it with an ever-changing, ever-moving form and ever-moving light and color, or rather, form, light, and color as they were perceived in reality. They are perhaps more devoted to naturalism than the realists because even as their pieces attempt to remove emotional attachment or interpretation, like the realists did, they're also remaining true to visual perception. Think about it. If something is moving quickly, if it's far away, or if it's seen in changing light, we can't distinguish small details or distinct lines. Go ahead, look out a window now. Look at a tree or a bush. Can you see the leaves or their outlines? Probably not, but your mind still knows it's a tree or a bush. Impressionists want to remain true to this realistic perception, rendering impressions of scenes without intellectualizing them keeping an innocent eye on reality. So in Impressionist works, we see what the artist sees at that moment, rather than what the artist knows or knew once upon a time. And really, in a way, this reflects the culture of an era that's impacted by the speed and movement of progress. In a changing world, perhaps it's best not to assert our perceived notions of reality. Claude Monet was perhaps the most famous of the Impressionists, and while other artist styles evolved, Monet remained faithful to Impressionism his whole life. He painted non-threatening natural scenes that eventually appealed to the middle-class taste, and he often painted outdoors. This was aided by the advent of collapsible paint tubes. He tried to capture scenes as they were at the moment, often painting the same scene in different lights, and he disliked any sort of revision or reimagining of reality. 
You're looking at his Impression Sunrise, for which the Impressionist movement is named. In this painting, you can see how Monet is a bit like Turner as his colors come together to reveal the beauty of a foggy morning, the sun just coming up in a cloudy sky. But you can also see how he's moving away from line, leaning more toward a realistic representation of light, and letting light and movement define his scene, just as it would define these things if we caught a glimpse of them in a pre-dawn haze. Edgar Degas is another master associated with the Impressionist movement, but his work is less cheerful and open than Manet's. Degas was said to have had a mean wit, so he was a bit of an asshole, and he was also a deliberate recluse. Perhaps because of this, his scenes are not of nature, but of interiors, where he explores architectural spaces and intimate moments. In general, Degas shares intimate moments as universal experience as he gives us keyhole visions of life. It's as though he's peeking in on things from afar, and he employs his innocent eye as he reveals things of beauty in less than ideal poses, the reality of beauty, as it were. In his ballet rehearsal on stage, we get a look at one of these keyhole visions. The view is from up high and from the side, and the life he shows is not idealized, but it's revealing and realistic. He still has some of that Impressionist light, but he uses stage light instead of sunlight, and there's still some of that Impressionist movement in the tutus of the dancers. Interestingly, these dancers were often children sent to work for the ballet and earn money for their families. They worked long hours, practiced until injured, and if they were fired, they might well be sold into prostitution. The parties, operas, and ballets were alive in Paris, but not everyone enjoyed them. So yes, it's a beautiful age, but amid the optimism was a grim reality. It's the one that Manet seems to recognize in his luncheon, and it's the one that Degas points to as he paints his dancers. And in this early modern era, there are more realistic impressions and explorations of potential in music, too. In the late 19th century, innovators have renovated or discarded the symphonic form as they seek communication beyond musical values. Their new treatment of melody, harmony, and rhythm is experimental and intentionally radical. They're trying to do more than just elicit emotion. They're exploring new ways to convey it. For many, this comes through in program music, where the narrative and musical interests combine to create symphonic tone poems where the emphasis is on the story. For others, there's an attempt to capture the true expression of the senses via music, and both are interested in capturing these realities whether or not they adhere to the symphonic form. Claude Debussy is a French composer who is interested in expressing the intangible, moving sensations of nature. For him, it's not about largesse, but more about precision, or just enough expression to give a realistic depiction of a mood or a scene. And what he gives us is sort of an impressionism in music. In La Mer, he composes three movements that are a kind of dialogue between the wind and the sea as they change throughout the day. And he achieves a realistic depiction by incorporating a changing flow of sound and shifting tone colors. Online, you'll find a link to Play of the Waves, which is the portion of this piece that evokes the sensations of the sea at midday. Listen to it and see if you can detect the sense or sound of light on the water. Debussy also captures natural atmospheres in Claire de Lune, but in this piece, the mood is more deliberate as he expresses not just light, but some of the emotion that it elicits. Be sure to check this one out when you get a chance, too. Richard Strauss is a German composer who, while he maintains many romantic characteristics in his emotional and illustrative works, gives us a bit of a psychological reality, too. In his works, he writes of the triumph and possibility of human potential amid turmoil. Strauss's Alpine Symphony is one of these human potential works, and in the end it makes its own rules, as rather than being broken up into the four-part symphonic form, it's one long 50-minute movement. The musical narrative describes a mountain expedition, the adventurers on the way up, the arrival at the summit, the descent, an encounter with a violent storm, and the peace at the end of the journey. The link that's included online musically depicts the arrival at the summit. Listen to it and let me know how you think the music is painting that scene. So yes, in addition to the Belle Epoque, there's growing frustration and restlessness. 
Economic disparity in countries and economic competition between nations builds resentment. All of those revolutions had people thinking that they had a right to share in the prosperity of the age, but often it was the wealthy who partook of the spoils, and the poor just kept on working. And that reaches a global scale, too, as some countries are making more money and or have more colonies than others. This adds to tension as countries begin to resent one another and colonies begin to resent their imperial domination. Also, due to medical advances, people are living longer and there's tremendous population growth. Add to that, people are emigrating, many of them to the U.S., hoping to fare better in newer territories. The result is too often overpopulation, food shortages, and housing crises. Perhaps sensing this unrest, many countries are maintaining huge armies. They want to protect what they've gained via revolution and prevent further devastation, but for many, the prevalence of armed forces makes them believe that war is imminent, and it also adds fuel to the fire. Finally, there's a dramatic drop in church attendance as people begin abandoning long-held religious traditions. Maybe people are working too much, maybe they're spending too much time partying, or maybe they like new sciences and outlooks that call for rationalism, not faith. Furthermore, psychology and anthropology are becoming popular in these eras, and they allow people to look at meanings of life that are outside the scope of religion. All of this starts a trend in religious insecurity as people question God's providence and the need for religious prescriptive morality. This is the world that philosophers, artists, and authors are trying to make sense of as the modern era looms on the horizon. And this is the world that German thinker Friedrich Nietzsche is part of when he attempts to take a fresh look at the quickly changing society. Nietzsche's dad was a happy, simple guy and a Lutheran minister, but he died when Nietzsche was five, and it was perhaps that that caused Nietzsche to begin questioning his relationship with God, a questioning that led him to philosophical insights on man's purpose and religion's place in a changing world. Nietzsche never formally studied philosophy, but he was well-educated, he became a full professor in his 20s, and he left his professorship and moved to Switzerland and Italy, where he would write numerous philosophical works. He wanted to take a look at a world where religion and state did not set moral standards. He wanted a new way of examining humanity's purpose and potential. Even the way in which he wrote his philosophies was new, relying on narrative rather than axioms, sharing the story of human morality as a story rather than a rule book. In his explorations, Nietzsche concludes that there is no God, and we do not have immortal souls. He declares that God is dead, and as such we must find a new way to live in a world of suffering and striving, a place where we are driven not by divinity, but by will. So how does that sound? What does a world without God or without spirituality look like? Go ahead, weigh the pros and cons for a second. Consider the impacts of this claim in a world that's got a millennia of religious tradition. Eventually, Nietzsche puts a new entity in charge of humanity's fate. Humanity. See, because there is no God, then morals must be created by man. And because they are man-made, we should question moral beliefs. We should test them and we should reevaluate them as humanity progresses. Those morals that we had, I mean, they were derived from outdated beliefs and based on values that no longer applied. We needed a new model, one that didn't hinge on good or evil. And this is just what Nietzsche suggests in his text, Beyond Good and Evil. Instead of those traditional models of good and evil, he asserts that what is good is what helps us become our best, what makes us feel good. And what is bad is what makes us feel bad or stifles us. With this model, those old morals, the one that make us feel shame or pity, they're bad. In fact, Nietzsche throws the whole of Christianity under the bus for this one. He asserts that Christianity is actually preventing progress and happiness. He calls Christianity a slave religion as it urges self-denial and self-sacrifice, and both of these are self-deprecating slave behaviors. Even gifted people are robbed of their potential by a system that demands they deny themselves. Instead, Nietzsche says we should be free to live life to the fullest, to fulfill our potential and a will to power. The will to power is the free assertion of will, and it's not impeded by moral restrictions. It's via the will to power that we push ourselves to greatness, striving for self-mastery and self-knowledge, questioning old ways and establishing new values without restrictions. 
It's here that life and creativity shine, and real humanity and real values, unfettered by the self-denial of bygone eras, are established. He writes about this in Thus Spake Zarathustra, a novel which details the questioning and overcoming of the finite and embracing of the infinite, the possibility of human greatness. In the novel, Zarathustra declares, I teach you the overman. Man is something that shall be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? See, once humans come to realize how human values limit them, how they limit themselves, then they can reach their fullest potential. Those who are able to achieve the greatest potential are ubermensch or supermen. These superior individuals are strong and bold. They're the people who have transcended the emotional and physical limitations of humanity, and they are able to live the fullest lives instead of frustrated ones. In fact, they and their legacy are man's only hope at everlasting life. They will be the writers of histories, the leaders of nations, the governors of new and more fitting moralities. What do you think? Are there any advantages to this system? Any problems with it? What has Nietzsche given us? Well, before Nietzsche, few would let go of God. Even Darwin didn't publish Origin for 20 years for fear of challenging God and tradition. What Nietzsche gives us becomes standard modern thought. Conversations change and humanity considers its own potential again. Only now it might be completely apart from religion. It might be completely on us. So we haven't talked about literature yet, but it's possible to evaluate some of these new ways of seeing there too, as impressionistic realities, new morality, and human potential show up in this medium as well. Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, for instance, illustrates something of an interest in self-knowledge and the dangers of moral ambiguity. In the novel, a poor student feels alienated from society, and he starts to believe that he's a superior human being, someone who's above conventional morality. He decides to murder a defenseless old woman as a demonstration of his power, but the situation almost immediately challenges him as there's a witness— so then, his single murder becomes a double homicide. The guilt and remorse he feels cut him off from society even more, and even though it doesn't look like he'll get caught, his internal punishment drives him to confess his crimes to the police. What Dostoevsky gives us is a multifaceted exploration of human frustrations and repressions as he delves into characters' psychological motives and shows their concerns, their arrogance, and their understanding realistically. He plays with the idea of will to power, too, and shows us how that might work out if one supposes power without morality. Dostoevsky, who was Russian, had a hard life himself. He was an Orthodox Christian and a political protester. At one point, he ran a secret printing press and created pamphlets against an abusive czarist regime. He was caught and sentenced to death, but rather than being executed, his sentence was commuted to one of imprisonment and hard labor. Perhaps these life circumstances account for the ambiguities of power and personal responsibility he writes about in Crime and Punishment. And... Before we get too far, we should probably talk about how the role of women in society has been changing. Ever more often as the years pass by, women are joining the workforce and the face of home life and femininity is changing because of it. Not coincidentally, it's around this time that divorce becomes more easily available to women. They petition for property rights and women in the Western world start to lobby for their right to vote. Amongst many of this nearly modern world, there seems to be an acknowledgement of dysfunction, an acknowledgement of unrealistic ideals of womanhood, and also an acknowledgement of a need for liberation from old ideas. And new rights mean that women may be able to take care of themselves, so no need to marry for security. Thus, depending where folks stand on the issue, people are looking at women, their needs, their lives, and their emotions a little differently. These issues are well addressed by Heinrich Ibsen, a Norwegian author who often wrote on sex and dysfunction. 
He was a progressive social critic, and as he was accustomed to exploring social taboos, he took on anti-feminist social conventions and addressed their hypocrisy in his work. In his play, A Doll's House, Nora is a woman whose life and interests have been sacrificed at the altar of convention. You see, before her husband became a rich lawyer, Nora forged his signature and borrowed some money to pay a bill, but she didn't tell her husband. She didn't want to embarrass him, and she knew that he was prideful. Sometime later, Nora's lender turns into a blackmailer, and he threatens to tell Nora's husband about her forgery unless she helps him get a promotion. He writes a letter detailing her crimes, and Nora manages to hide it away from her husband. Meanwhile, the blackmailer finds love and a woman to take care of his children, so he decides it's no longer worth pursuing Nora. Eventually, Nora's husband reads the letter. He is horrified and angry with her. He declares her unfit to raise his children and tells Nora she's ruined his life. Then, sometime later, he finds another letter. The blackmailer has returned the loan. They no longer owe any money and Nora's husband is overjoyed at their good fortune. But it's too late. Nora has new insight into her husband. He doesn't care about her at all. He doesn't care about her intentions or her emotions. All he cares is that she behaves like an emotionless and obedient doll in the house that he's made for her. She tells her husband that she needs to leave to make sense of herself and everything around her. She slams the door and leaves her life in the house behind. So this is a pretty strong critique of a woman's place in society, and even if Nora leaves, she may not find happiness. The point is that she'll be able to make sense of it for herself, despite the challenges that she'll face for flouting cultural norms. Kate Chopin's story, The Awakening, is another take on coming of age in the era of women's liberation. Chopin was from the American South, New Orleans specifically, and when her husband died, he left her in debt. She had to return home to mom, but there she was unable to keep up with the family business, even though she tried, and after her mom died, a doctor suggested that she try writing. He thought it might be therapeutic. It was then that Chopin came into her own. She was widely published in her own lifetime, and she shared great insight into the mind of the early modern woman. The Awakening was denounced as amoral and banned early on as it addressed female sexuality as one means by which women may be liberated from social oppression. In the story, Edna is pigeonholed into a meaningless, loveless existence. She doesn't want to be a mother or an emotionless, dutiful wife, and she's generally uninterested in the occupations prescribed for women. In her dissatisfaction, she has an affair, and she experiences there a sexual awakening. Afterward, she's criticized by other women who feel she ought to be more interested in being a nurturing mother and supportive wife, but she bravely leaves her husband and sets out to create a life of her own. Everything looks good until her new lover, who was once her biggest cheerleader, reveals that he too wants to possess her. He leaves when she says that while she's left her husband, she will not divorce him. When she's surrounded by disappointed men, disdainful women, and unhappy, lonely examples of women who've chosen to go it alone, Edna sees no other way to free herself, and she walks into the ocean and ends her own life. Now, Both of these stories are dark, and sometimes they're pretty severe, but they both speak to the interior lives of women who, up until now, were seen as objects, allegories, and bystanders in society. Think of the women we've seen in the arts thus far, and keep that image in your head so you can witness the changes in their representations from here on out. And now, back to the arts. While Impressionism ruled in the 1870s and 1880s, post-Impressionism was hot on its heels, and just a generation later, things were changing again. Artists between 1880 and the early 1900s were rejecting Impressionism. Some found the style especially limiting, and they sought works with a clearer purpose, greater experimentation, and even a clearer break from the traditional representation. As a result, there are many individual styles in this era as artists experiment with illusion versus reality, and many opt for greater order and intellectualism in painting while still rejecting the strictly representational art of the salon. One of these artists is Georges Seurat, and he is a master of pointillism. 
Pointillism is the use of small dabs of pure color to create a larger image. So, like the Impressionist, Seurat created the illusion of reality without line, and he did this by using a very strict color theory. He applied a dot of one color next to a dot of another color, thereby forcing the mind of the viewer to combine the colors and construct reality. Additionally, he organized the figures in his painting so that they had harmonious geometric relationships. All of this is a very intellectual and strategic approach to color, to space, and to technique in general, and all of it added greater order and purpose to painting. Paul Cezanne is another of this experimental crew, and he's also building on Impressionism, but he seems to want to make an impression of something solid and durable. Cezanne worked from the precept that all forms in nature were based on cones, spheres, or cylinders, and his paintings demonstrate this priority as they're more concerned with presenting a solid and ordered composition than they are with realism. Cezanne's paintings convey a sense of mass or weight in their focus on shape and color, and even with these weightier works, Cezanne's paintings still have vitality. And then, perhaps the most famous of the post-impressionists is Vincent van Gogh. For me, he actually rides the line between post-impressionism and expressionism, and I've placed him here as kind of a bridge between the movements. He's clearly borrowing from an impressionist tradition, but the color and emotion in his work sets him apart from other post-impressionists we've discussed thus far. In his works, he painted everything that was around him. Still lives, cafes, and countrysides were not new themes, but he was using more color and employing something called impasto, or applying the paint with thick, bold brushstrokes in his paintings. Now let's take a look at some paintings, shall we? Seurat's most famous work is Sunday on La Grande Jatte. And while it may not look impressive at first glance, you must consider that the work is six feet by 10 feet in real life. So there are millions of dots constructing this image. Both shape and color are precisely ordered to reconstruct a scene from an island in the Seine near Paris. And this precision gives the painting and the people in it an air of formality and rigidity that is once unrealistic and realistic and that it makes clear that this image is an illusion. Here we have Circus, another work by Seurat, and in it, again, he's given us ordered form and mastery of pointillism. But if we take an even closer look at this one, you can see the intricacy of this technique and how the dots of color come together to force our eye to create a new tone altogether. This is next level impressionism for sure. In Mont saint victor Cézanne is clearly not concerned with perspective as he renders the mountain in flat planes of color. All of the details are removed to create the serenity of a solid, colorful landscape. It's up to the viewer to assign depth and distance, and again the painting knows it's an illusion. We can still make out the background, the foreground, the peaks of the mountain, the trees and the sky, but all of the details are removed to create solid, colorful, formless landscape. In a way, our eye is responsible for the mental reconstruction of this image. And then we have Van Gogh. Van Gogh had an interesting life, and no doubt you've heard something about him. In 1880, at 27 years old, Van Gogh entered an academy for arts in Brussels. The following winter, Vincent fell in love, had his heart broken, and it was then that he really began painting. When he started painting, Impressionism was just becoming popular, and in Paris he was discussing art with the most avant-garde and influential artist of his time. With the help of his brother, he arranged to show his work. He got positive reviews, but he was unable to sell any pieces. His brother then arranged for him to stay at a house in the country with another prominent artist, Paul Gauguin. When Vincent moved to the country, he experienced both the most productive and creative period of his life and a period of great turmoil. He was lonely and desperate to express himself in art, but somehow the art wasn't able to capture all that he felt. Add to that, he and Gauguin didn't get along. Gauguin grew weary of Vincent's neediness and their disharmony resulted in violence. The turmoil persisted as Vincent was driven to cut off one of his own ears, and when he was overtaken by hallucinations and seizures, he was voluntarily hospitalized. He only painted for 10 years, and in that time he produced some 900 works, and he only ever sold one. 
His most famous painting, The Starry Night, was painted while he was hospitalized, and it's exemplary of Van Gogh's style. In it, we see the nervous energy of his short, choppy brushstrokes, the emotionally evocative movement of line and shape, and the expressive use of color. Again, there is the impression of movement, careful use of spirals and thick brushstrokes. Here, the impostos' creation of texture and dense color create a mood too, giving the work gravity as well as physical and emotional depth. So what do you think? What is the mood of this piece? And then, what is the mood of this one? How do the colors in Night Cafe make you feel? In this one, the harsh contrasts of color and the exaggerated perspective make the cafe feel sickly and malevolent. Again, the impasto and brushwork direct our eye to the sad figures scattered around the room, adding to the anxious and unsettled tone of this work. Indeed, Van Gogh himself said, the night cafe was a place where one can ruin oneself, go mad, or commit a crime. So yes, with Van Gogh, we see some of the weight that's being added to post-impressionistic works, and we also get a taste of expressionism, too. So... You remember all of those feelings of unrest that butted up against the beauty of the Belle Epoque? Well, they're coming to a boil in Germany and Eastern Europe, and this comes through in the distorted forms and bold colors of expressionist art. As expressionism is more about emotion than the representation, there is often little to no optical realism. And while these works aren't entirely abstracted, they do attempt to convey an emotional rather than a representational reality. Edvard Munch's work is autobiographical as much as it is social and psychological commentary. His work depicts states of mind and emotions, and it often involves themes of misery, sickness, and death. Munch himself had a couple of tragic love affairs, and he succumbed to alcoholism, so these works may be as much an attempt to convey an inner emotional reality as they are an attempt to convey a cultural emotional reality. In his painting, The Scream, he depicts alarm and hysteria, and he likewise examines his own deep, dark anxiety. The distorted figure in the painting is meant to match an emotional reality, as in his own words, Munch stated, one evening, I was walking along a path. The city was on one side and the fjord below. I felt tired and ill. I stopped and looked out over the fjord. The sun was setting and the clouds turning blood red. I sensed a scream passing through nature. It seemed to me that I heard the scream. I painted this picture, painted the clouds as actual blood. The colors shrieked. This became the scream. The brushwork and lines all seem to direct us through this nightmare, and the color, too, conveys a mood rather than a realistic depiction. All of these elements combine to direct us to the figure frozen amid a torrent of emotion. Another expressionist is the Russian painter Vasily Kandinsky. Kandinsky preferred abstraction because he believed the physical sciences undermined our confidence in our perceptions. And if science was going to prove our perception and illusion anyway, then why fight the illusory? Additionally, the rumor is that Kandinsky was a synesthetic, so his senses were crossed and he heard colors and saw sounds. Now this helped him by the idea that perception wires could easily be crossed, and it also led to the influence of music on his work. He said of his own painting, I applied streaks and blobs of color onto the canvases with a palette knife, and I made them sing with all the intensity I could. And his Composition 4 is one of those where abstraction and color create an emotional and psychological reality. Take a minute to examine this work. Is it wholly abstracted, or is there something going on here? What do you think the colors and lines are trying to tell you? Notice how the painting is divided abruptly in the center by two thick black vertical lines. What is the mood on either side of the painting? The colors on the left aren't blended well, and the lines are sharp, jagged, and entangled. What could this indicate? I know there's a rainbow, and this makes us want to think happy thoughts, but really there is violence on this side of the painting. Now look at the right side. 
The lines on the right are calm. There are softer forms, and the colors combine harmoniously. What might this indicate? What is being divided here? The story that goes with this picture is that the dividing lines are actually two lances held by red-hatted Cossacks. There's a blue mountain crowned by a castle in the center, too. And on the left, there are two boats and Cossacks with swords raised battling over them. Then on the right, two lovers recline on a lawn as two robed figures observe them from a hilltop. Now what do you think? What's the message of this painting, and how does that reflect this era? Unfortunately, after a Nazi raid, many of Kandinsky's compositions were destroyed, but for now, he's showing us where visual arts are headed, away from representation, and toward emotional evocation. And that, folks, is a quick look at the early modern era. If you think things are getting weird and complicated, just wait, there's even weirder and more complicated stuff on the way. And if you like what you're seeing here, not to worry, there's much more in store. Until next time.